Greetings YouTube, I'm Mephring225 and welcome to my playthrough of Mega Man X5 for the PlayStation. Yes, it's finally time for me to continue my playthroughs of the X games. It feels like it's been forever since the last one. There's just been a lot going on, I've got games to play, I've got projects to work on, but finally I found it in me to play through X5. Now, part of the reason it took me so long to get back to X is because X5, I don't remember it as fondly as a lot of people seem to. There's just a lot that's wrong with X5, even though there's a lot that's right with X5 as well. So I'm gonna get into this, there's probably way too much to talk about in the short amount of time I have before the gameplay starts, uh, but I did find a way to make this a little bit less painful for me. See, there is actually a mod of X5 called the Improvement Project, and it just fixes a lot of bad stuff with X5. You can skip cutscenes, you can turn off the navigator, which I will talk about later. Um, there's a couple of changes that are questionable, and I'll talk about that too. But basically, with the mod, I uh, think I am pretty comfortable with playing X5, and not only playing through it, but also playing through it with a little extra challenge on top. See, X5 is actually the first game in the series to introduce difficulty levels. So we're going to play this on extreme mode, and we're also, well, I'm also not going to use any armor is the entire playthrough. It's going to be unarmored X all the time. Also, this title screen, that's a new thing from the mod as well. So as you can see here, you can uh, turn off the navigator. What the navigator is, X5 for some reason decided to introduce a bunch of characters that do absolutely nothing and nobody cares about them. One of them is a navigator who will talk to you and provide advice as you play, but she just had this tendency to just interrupt the gameplay and spend way too much time talking, so nobody liked her. And uh, she becomes a much better character in X6, but uh, that's a ways off. Uh, I could play the Improvement Project for that mod, uh, game as well. There's a, a mod for X6 as well, so I could check that out in the future. Also, one of the features that you're not going to see is that this mod actually retranslated the entire game. So the grammar is a lot better, it's a much easier to read if you care about that. But anyways... X5 is well known for being the intended conclusion to the X series, so that's why we have a wrecked highway as the first stage, with a bunch of cars and some familiar looking enemies. It's all a throwback to X1, and as you just saw, you now have the ability to duck. I have no idea how we went so long without being able to duck, but there it is. And you've also got the ability to hang off of certain ropes as well. Um, there's one present in this stage, but you don't really need it, you can just jump off this platform like so. Anyways, that's the end of the intro stage. It wasn't very long at all. So you'll notice that as we pass by the arbitrary wall crushing segment, um, X has his armor at the start here. X5 actually provides you with the same armor that you could collect in X4. Now, in X4, I made it a point to play a zero for that game, because if you play a zero in X5, then he just trivializes the entire game, to be honest. So, I wanted to do an X-only playthrough for this game as well, but past this intro stage... Oh, hi Sigma. Um, this boss fight is completely easy, and there's actually a story reason for it. So, you actually just thwart all of his attacks by ducking. Anyways, um, you start with X's armor. Now, in the vanilla game, without the mod, if you pick X, then you lose the Z-Buster on zero. Like, if you pick X for the intro stage, you lose the Z-Buster, which nobody uses the Z-Buster, to be honest. But if you pick Zero for the intro stage, you actually lose this armor. So, um, I have no idea what was up with that, but the mod makes it so that you do not lose anything. Uh, this doesn't really matter, because I'm not going to use Zero anyways. And the reason I'm, like... I just don't want to trivialize X5, because it seems like X5 was designed with your use of armors and upgrades in mind. So, like, but if you use those armors and upgrades, then it actually feels like you trivialize the entire point of the difficulty. So, unarmored X, I'm going to use the power-up parts, which I'll talk about later. And, um, I'm not going to use any armors, but I am going to use weapons. And, um, as we get to the stage select screen here... I'm actually going to choose a very odd stage for the first stage. Like, um, normally you wouldn't think to play this stage first because it's actually really, really weird. Like, it starts off with a ride chaser segment, and they don't exactly make it clear that you can move during the ready animation. So a lot of people just, like, crashed into that first pit over and over again. It's like something out of Action 52. You kind of have to realize that you can move during the ready animation, which is... Not a good start to this. Like, this is one of uh, X5's many, many flaws. 
Also, this uh, this entire Ride Chaser segment is flawed in general because it relies a lot on trial and error gameplay, especially with regards to the walls you have to blow up, and um, at the end here you actually have to be like in the middle of the screen to avoid getting crushed by the wall, and you have to use the dash in order to get past that last destructible wall. And on top of all of that, you'll notice that there were these little pellets you, you could collect throughout the entire segment. Uh, they are used to destroy that door. If you destroy that door, then the first armor piece is actually behind that door. But again, unarmored X only, so we're not going to do that. And about the armors in general, um, in the vanilla version of X5, one really weird thing is that they actually have two sets of armor that you can pick up and collect. But you can't use the armors at all until you have assembled them entirely. So... You know, it makes it kind of pointless to find these armor upgrades when you can't even use them until you've collected all of them. And collecting them is seriously annoying as well. I'm not even talking about the stage right now, but I want to make a point about the armors. So one thing that this improvement project mod does is that you actually can use the armors before you've assembled them completely. However, the armor pieces will have a weaker effect than what they would have had if you had assembled them completely in the vanilla game. So that's nice, I'm still not going to use them because they can still very easily trivialize the game. If you pick up the body parts, for example, they actually have all damage, like the fourth armor does, the armor you start the game with. Anyways, um, there are some Reploids sitting around that you can rescue if you feel like it. I don't. Uh, there's no real reason to pick them up. They give you an extra life and some energy back, but I don't really know why they were put there, to be honest. Like, they don't really serve a purpose until X6 and X7, and that was very embarrassing. You can see that this puzzle that I was supposed to solve, it kind of backfired on me because the door decided to close on me. Very unfortunate. So yes, uh, this puzzle can make the stage a bit slow-paced, especially after that very fast-paced ride chaser segment. A common complaint about X5 is that it's a very slow-paced game. Like, um, there are stages that take a long time. We'll actually be getting to a couple of such stages, but hey, uh, we're almost up to the boss. We just have to solve this one final puzzle that does not involve really attacking any enemies or getting past traps or anything. Yeah. But anyways, we're up to the boss. The boss is named Volt Kraken in this version. Now, a weird thing about boss names is that in Japan, they have very standard boss names for the uh, Mavericks in this game. But in the original American localization, all the names were changed to parodies of the band members of Guns N' Roses. For, so, for example, Volt Kraken was changed to Squid Adler, which just sounds so stupid. But yeah, the mod changes all the names back to what they were originally. The only real loss, in my opinion, is Duff McWhalen, which is so stupid it's awesome. But yeah... Alright, so this boss, the reason I picked Volt Kraken first is because he actually has a really good weapon for X, so I want to get that first. Yeah, in the later X games, X's weapon set starts getting, like, more and more underwhelming. I talked about this in X4, but I think Volt Kraken's weapon is the only good one for X, so I'm going to pick that up as soon as possible. And there are a couple weapons that I will use occasionally as the game goes on as well. Yes, the... Uh, not a really a difficult boss fight, you just have to make sure that he doesn't try to wrap his tentacles around you. Bye, Squidward! <laughs> Actually, I don't think Squidward even was a Kraken. Oh well. So, moving on, that's one stage down, and uh, three more to go for this video. Yes, I have to split this video into three parts in order to show off the entire game. I could have made this a one-hour playthrough if I decided to skip four of the Maverick levels, because there's a way to skip to the end game. It's really weird. I don't know why X5 and X6 give you the ability to skip to the end game, but they do. But I decided to show off the entire game. Because uh, I, I think, you know, considering this challenge that I'm putting myself through, it actually should be uh, shown off this way. So as we move to Crescent Grizzly, the second stage we'll be playing through, I want to mention the way the timer works, because this is really weird. Um, so... What the, the plot of this game is that the hunters are trying to stop a space colony from crashing into the Earth, so they need to go into the stages to collect items that will help them accomplish this. And every time you play through a stage, the timer goes down by one hour. It's not a real-time timer. Uh, oh, by the way, just want to briefly mention that I'm going to be using the weapon I got from Volt Kraken in this stage. It's really useful. You'll see it used a lot. 
So, uh, the way the timer works is that every time you enter a stage, the timer goes down by one hour. It's not a real-time timer. But you have 16 hours to beat the game, and there are only eight Maverick levels. So you can kind of see, like, the timer basically doesn't matter. That's the thing about X5. There are a lot of new ideas here that just don't really matter at all. Like, um... Like, even if you get a game over, that doesn't really cause the timer to decrease. Like, they should have, like, taken another hour off if you got a game over, because that would have added some tension in the game as well. So, anyways, you can see that the Tri-Thunder is wrecking these enemies here. It's so powerful, and it does so much. Like, it shoots off so many bullets in very interesting ways as well. It's really useful, and this should have been the standard that the other weapons were designed for. But a lot of them just don't really do all that much to be honest so yes you can see that you have to destroy the trucks in order to advance and uh, every time you destroy one you better get off the truck before it blows up completely and you uh, apparently i don't know fall to the ground and die or something but there's the first sub tank there are only two sub tanks just like an x4 there's also going to be a weapon tank and an ex tank and um i still don't know why those are there like extra lives don't even matter in this game because whenever you use a continue, you just go right back to where the checkpoint was in the first place, so it's it, it doesn't even really matter. All right, so we're coming up to the boss here. There hasn't really been a lot to talk about in the stages so far. I just blow through everything with the Tri Thunder. So uh, Crescent Grizzly is the boss that you're kind of supposed to destroy first. So he's not really that difficult. While I am fighting him, I will talk about how boss levels work because this is really hilarious too. So, the boss level there is dependent on two things. Your character rank, because your characters actually get ranked on how well they cleared the stages, too. Um, and it depends on the amount of remaining time. So, as the time decreases, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. It has to do with the Sigma virus constantly infecting everything and making everything worse and worse. So, as the infection deepens, the Mavericks are going to get stronger and stronger. Which I think is pretty interesting. But the thing is, in the vanilla game, uh, you could actually earn extra heart tanks, extra uh, weapon tanks, which increase the amount of sub-weapon ammo you can carry, um, by defeating bosses when they are at high levels. And if you want to earn the maximum number of heart tanks, weapon tanks, and such, uh, you would have to intentionally lose a lot of hours off the time if you didn't get a really good rank in the first level you clear. So that's really annoying. But the thing is, these bosses also drop power-up parts. Uh, depending on whether you choose a heart tank or a weapon tank, if you defeated a high enough level boss, you would earn a power-up part on top of it. The parts are like in Extreme 2. You have a variety of bonuses to choose from, but the thing is, in X5, um, if you did not intentionally lower the game timer by getting a bunch of game overs intentionally, then... Um, you just wouldn't be able to get eight parts from all eight bosses. So, thank goodness we have the Improvement Project mod. You are guaranteed a choice of a heart tank or a weapon energy tank, and you are guaranteed to get both of the parts that you would have been able to choose from, which I think is a little bit questionable, because originally you could only pick from one of the two parts. Now you're guaranteed to get both. So, you know... Um, they're not, uh, that kind of lowers the replayability a little bit, because maybe you thought a heart tank would have been, like, superior to a weapon energy tank, but maybe choosing the weapon energy tank would have given you a more desirable part. So anyways, um, when you defeat two and six Mavericks, there's a mini-boss of sorts named Dynamo, who interrupts you in order to drain more time away from you. He's basically just stalling so that the colony crashes. And uh, he's not really that difficult, which may tie into the fact that he's just stalling here. But um, yeah, that move with the giant purple sword, that's the most difficult move from him to dodge, because it comes out very quickly. And I wish I could have done a no damage run against him, it's not really that difficult aside from dodging that one specific move. Because that would have given me a higher rank, and um, like, the Improvement Project mod basically made it so you don't have to worry about rank at all, but it still would be nice to have that big old UH, which probably stands for Ultimate Hunter. That's the highest rank you can get. That's probably really difficult to get to. Like, I have no idea what sort of requirements there are for ranking in X5. In fact, I'm pretty sure in X5 that you are actually penalized for killing more Mavericks, which doesn't really make a lot of sense as far as the ranking goes. Like, you could just ignore ranking completely, and it's totally okay. 
All right, so with Dynamo's first attack out of the way, we can move on to the third stage that we are going to play through. Like, I'm so used to the original North American localization names, by the way, that I kind of, like, I have those internalized. So, um, I'm probably going to call this next boss Izzy Glow, even though he's really called, um, like, Shining Firefly or something. <laughs> so, we actually did get our first power-up part for X. There, uh, the parts that I got, um, one of them is for X only, and the other is for Zero. So, the one for X is called the Quick Charge. It... It, um, it halves the amount of time it takes for a charge shot to be ready, which is going to be really, really helpful. This lets you unload a lot more damage a lot quicker. And some of you out there might think, if I'm challenging myself to play the game with Unarmored X only on Extreme Mode, then shouldn't I ban the power-up parts as well? Well, I would have agreed with you if not for something that happens in the final stage of the game. And uh, we're going to see what that is. Like, um, you probably know what I'm referring to, but trust me when I say... I would prefer to have power-up parts rather than none at all, because with none at all, um, like, again, if you refuse to use any of the armors and upgrades that the game is expecting you to use, then it's going to be really, really difficult and probably really annoying, too. So another change that the Improvement Project mod made is that um, those that wooden block that I just destroyed, normally you would need a fire weapon found later on in the game in order to break that, but the Improvement Project mod made it so that you can destroy it with thunder, which... That's fine, I guess. I, I guess I'll take the EX tank if I have to. At least I know where it is this time. So yes, the EX tank, it makes you start with four extra lives, but as I've gone over, lives are useless. And this is also the first appearance of the Sigma virus heads. So yes, the virus that is infecting the world is now manifesting in the form of these Sigma virus heads. And the deal with those is that if you touch, like, four of them, I think then X will get infected and start losing health, but Zero, oddly enough, he becomes invincible when fully infected. Hmm, that's kind of suspicious, don't you think? Well, anyways, the virus heads, they're really... They're another thing in X5 that does not justify its point whatsoever, because there's not enough virus heads to ever threaten you with an actual infection. And not only that, some of the stages just don't have virus heads at all. There are power-up parts. Oh, by the way, it was really annoying to get crushed <laughs> by the uh, the spiked platform there. So yeah, um, there are power-up parts in this game that allow you to protect yourself from viral infection. But when Zero becomes invincible when he's infected and there's not really enough virus heads to infect you in the first place, makes you wonder what the purpose of those even was. There are stages where there are no virus heads at all. So yes, we've got a segment that reminds me of Split Mushroom Stage, but I don't really think it's exactly the same. Like, it looks so familiar for some reason. Maybe they, like, use the same model, but when they, um, turn the model into a 2D graphic, they decide to use a different angle. That's kind of what it feels like. Anyways, uh, this is not a really a difficult mini-boss. You saw earlier that I tried to use the Crescent Shot. Um, it's basically just a random spread of bullets. It's like the Needle Cannon from Mega Man 3. It's really not that good. Damage is not that good. Uh, the spread makes it annoying to use. I just don't see why you would use it, unless you're using it as a box of weakness. Uh, that's the thing about X5. It shares a lot in common with Mega Man 5's weapons in that regard. They're either only useful if you know where they can be useful, like in very specific spots, or they are just useful as boss weaknesses. Aside from the Tri-Thunder, I've already gone over why that's useful. Now, I thought the same thing about X4, but the thing is there's this um, YouTuber named Magnus Zero. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he plays through, like, he's a high-level Zero player, so, uh, but he occasionally does the X-Series as well, and he is currently doing a playthrough of X4 that makes use of the weapons much, much more than a normal player would. So that's been interesting to watch, and you should totally check that out if you're interested in a Mega Man player who's actually good at the game. Not like me. <laughs> I mean, why did I get hung up on that wall cannon for so long? Anyway, since I've been ignoring the armor pieces, since this is an unarmored X only playthrough, I'm gonna talk about what the Falcon armor does. The Falcon armor is one of the two armors you can get. A piece of it is in this stage. Uh, basically, what the Falcon Armor does is it lets you fly throughout the levels, and this really trivializes a lot of the platforming areas. It is super broken. But, uh, sadly, it does not let you punch things. That would have been really cool. Falcon Punch! <laughs> yes. 
So uh, we're up to the boss now. This is Shining Fireflay or Dr. Izzy Glow or whatever you want to call him. He's kind of annoying. He teleports around a lot and he shoots off a laser with a trail that, um, well, not a laser. He, ha he has a laser, but he also has a firefly shot, which will leave a trail as it uh, dances around the screen. That can be a little bit annoying to dodge, but it's very easily destructible. There it is, in fact. So yeah, just make sure to charge shot him, and since I've got quick charge equipped, I can really let off a lot of damage. I think the quick charge is actually the uh, fastest way to deal damage to bosses. Like, like um, the Tri Thunder is his weakness, but again, like with some of the other Mega Man games out there, I think weaknesses actually make the battles take longer because you have to wait through uh, an annoying animation of the boss getting hurt. And weaknesses can also trivialize them as well, so again, I'm gonna use... Like, even during the rematches, I used uh, Unarmored X's Buster Shots exclusively, I think. So anyways, with him out of the way, there's only one stage left for this segment, and uh, this upcoming stage is rather infamous because it's a very, very slow stage. It's an auto-scroller. <laughs> an auto-scroller in Mega Man. How about that? Luckily, the Improvement Project mod makes the... Um, makes the auto-scroller go faster than it normally does. At least it feels that way. Uh, it definitely feels like some of the attacks in this stage come out faster than normal. So anyways, um, we've picked up two more power-up parts. First up is the Shock Buffer, which um, basically, I think it makes you take half damage and it also reduces the amount of um, hit stun. And uh, we also get the Hyper Dash, which will increase the speed of our dash. And um, to be honest, the Shock Buffer and the Hyper Dash are kind of overpowered. But, um, especially in combination with some other parts later, but whatever. This stage, it doesn't really matter much for this stage. At least the Hyper Dash doesn't. So yes, Tidal Whale, also known as Duff McWhalen. <laughs> I'm gonna miss that name. So, the music here is actually uh, a remix of Bubble Crab from X2, and for a while I didn't really know why they went with a Bubble Crab remix, but I realized that this stage is actually a shout-out to Bubble Crab stage, because you have this giant battleship that chases you throughout the level. Of course, you have to actually destroy this one. So anyways, you can blow up the cannons on the top and bottom of the ship, and that's going to make it a lot easier, because those things will shoot at you and they are hilariously awful to avoid. So the Tri Thunder, again, coming in very handy here. Uh, the weapon we got from Shining Firefly is this laser that you can control with the D-pad. Kind of like the snake in, um, Snake. Have you played Snake? It's kind of like that. And it is kind of a little useful against this mini-boss because, uh, when, when, you, when, you when you actually fight the guy later, when he has a health bar and everything, you can use the little trail that the Firefly leaves behind. That'll do additional damage too. But you have to stand still during the entire time the bullet is out, and that's just so annoying. Like, it's almost impossible to, like, if you, if you shoot that thing, you're gonna take damage because something is going to attack you anyways. You can't stand still in a Mega Man game. So yes, this part of the stage is throwing off. By the way, these enemies are from Launch Octopus's stage. And now that I mentioned Launch Octopus, I actually forgot to mention that Volt Kraken and Launch Octopus are actually friends in the Mega Man Deep lore, and that's why Volt Kraken attacked us in the first place. He was kind of annoyed at what, what uh, we did to Launch Octopus. So yeah, uh, now the thing has a life bar, we can actually shoot at it, and you can see that the Tri Thunder's effect of the bullet actually going um, up along the wall, because for some reason the mini boss's body counts as a wall after you've destroyed the cannons, uh, it's proving to be very effective here. Probably should have switched over to the uh, Firefly and used that, but that would have made it difficult to avoid getting hit by the enemies that come out of him as well. So yes, with the first part of the auto-scroller out of the way, it's now time for part two of the auto-scroller because you have to fight that thing three times. So yes, it's a big shout-out to Bubble Crab because you have to destroy the pieces of the battleship throughout the stage, and the thing will also respawn if you, um... Well, it'll respawn if you die, for one thing. But it'll also respawn if you enter the stage again, so I have no idea why you have to destroy it multiple times. But yeah, having to go through all of this every time you want to replay the stage, and there's an armor piece in this stage as well. There's also a heart tank, but the armor piece is pretty, um, it's pretty egregious because in order to, in the vanilla version of the game, in order to get the armor piece for this stage, you have to actually have the weapon from this stage's boss. So yeah, you had to play through the stage two times in order to get the falcon armor and 100% complete the game. Because you need the falcon armor in order to get the pieces of the other armor as well, so... This stuff really just doesn't end. 
So yes, now we're going to have to actually fight this thing with a health bar. And again, the Tri Thunder is going to be very effective here because for some reason you weren't able to destroy the top and bottom parts of the ship during the auto scroller, but you can here and now. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And there's a convenient ceiling for the Tri Thunder to hit the top part of the ship with and destroy those missiles coming from the top as well. This weapon is just so good. And it's good throughout the entire game as well. There are plenty of enemies that get blown up by it. So yes, for some reason they take away the water here. I don't really know why they did that. If it was flooded, then you'd think it wouldn't be able to drain so easily. So again, the improvement project comes to the rescue. Normally that block can't be destroyed by the Tri Thunder, so we're gonna go ahead and go up there and see what's up there. And hey, a heart tank. Yes, there are still heart tanks throughout the eight stages, and another annoying thing that the Improvement Project mod fixes is that in the vanilla version of the game, picking up a heart tank would um, cause only the character who picked it up to get the bonus. So, um, like, if you wanted to completely max out X, then that would be impossible because certain heart tanks can only be picked up by zero, and vice versa. So, whenever you pick up a heart tank in the mod, it will be applied to both characters. So that's another good thing. And yes, I wanted to go further into the level, but um, I guess they wanted you to come in here with a falcon armor or something. I'm surprised the improvement project didn't do something with that. But yeah, it just spits you back out here anyways. And here is the um, armor piece for this level. Again, I'm not going to pick it up because this is an unarmored X-only playthrough, but I just wanted to make a point here that the improvement project mod makes it possible to destroy that little thingamajig and get past the wall with the uh, Firefly laser instead of the Goose Shaver, which is the weapon you would normally need. That's probably a very weird weapon name, but it's the weapon you get from this stage. So yes, you can't do that in vanilla, but you can in the mod, so praise the mod! This is, uh, yeah, that's gonna be a recurring theme here. <laughs> Alright, so this section, this is probably the easiest auto-scroller, you just gotta stay as far up as you possibly can and shoot out enemies when they appear and avoid those lasers. And it's pretty simple. So yeah, um, not much to talk about for the rest of the stage. We're just waiting and waiting. This is one of the reasons people kind of don't remember X5 all that fondly. It's because of stages like this. And I would say that the latter half of the game is actually very good compared to the first half. But then you get to the Maverick levels, the end game stages, and then <laughs> things get really, really crazy. So yeah, I'm hyping this up, but uh, it's worth hyping up. So again, uh, to deal with this mini boss, you have to destroy that little thingamajig that respawns every so often, and it will remove the barrier on the weak point. Very easy with the Tri Thunder, because it will also take out uh, the cannon beneath you, if you stand in this position, of course. So yes, that's nice and easy, and this I think this is also the mini boss's weakness. I don't really know for sure. I think all the weapons do a lot more damage than normal. And if I were playing with armors, the fourth armor that you start the game with, as well as the Falcon armor, they let you do charge special weapons. That's still a thing in the X series. But since I'm doing unarmored X only, that's not going to be available. And I think some of those do trivialize the game as well, so all the more reason to avoid it and uh, give the viewers the best show that I possibly can. Hey look, a spiked wall, just like uh, in the Bubble Crab rematch. Kinda. Alright, so Tidal Whale, Duff McWhalen, he's actually a really interesting boss in my opinion, because he actually creates this little platforming thing by setting out these ice blocks. And then, um, a little later he will start pulling the blocks back towards you and there are going to be spikes along the way and he'll also fire the Goose Shaver at you to be annoying. The Goose Shaver is a little bit like Search Snake from Mega Man 3. But past half health, you will actually do something even more dangerous, which is to shoot these very fast-moving ice blocks at you in order to try and smash you into the spikes. I kind of like that fight. I mean, it was really easy because I have quick charge, and quick charge makes it very easy to pile on lots and lots of damage. So one thing I haven't mentioned is that after defeating four bosses and getting four items, uh, the hunters attempt to destroy the colony, uh, this first attempt to destroy the colony doesn't always work. It's actually random whether or not this works. So, I actually got the scene where they succeed in destroying the colony and they let you go to the endgame directly. Again, it's really weird that X5 lets you do this. 
but I'm actually going to reload until I get the other version of the cutscene where they do not destroy it and have to go with plan B. What's also strange is that you're also allowed to manually attempt to destroy the colony, like if you want to just do it earlier than normal with reduced chances of success. That's just so very strange because it means you could advance to the end game without even destroying any of the bosses if you're very, very lucky. Anyways, that's it for this part. Next time we take on four more Mavericks. See you later.